Did you find the book of Job this morning? Some years ago, I was in a service in uh, Crockett County, which is no reflection. What I'm going to say is no reflection on Crockett County. But anyway, a uh, fellow asked me, he said, why is that called Job? It's J-O-B, Job, preacher. And he was convinced of that. And he was greatly distressed that I would call it Job. Well, I wasn't there when it was written, but over the years, I've only heard it referred to as Job. And so we want this morning to talk about God speaking in the whirlwind and giving an answer to Job for the condition his condition is in. Now, Job is going to issue a press conference for anyone who will listen. He has, so, he has three persons who are called his friends and it's really dubious whether they're his friends and his wife, of course, also survives what occurs. And he's going to give a press conference and talk a little bit about all that he has been through and kind of process what he thinks of all he's been through and why these things have happened to him. I guess all of us uh, over these last uh, few weeks and months have been taken kind of back on all the things that we've heard and seen and had explained to us and and uh, we've seen officials who have had to stand and deliver and we've read different uh, things that have been issued over this time and and I brought with me uh, some guidelines from uh, one company that uh, will go nameless and uh, these are the guidelines that we're to stay six feet apart uh, we're to wash our hands for 20 seconds and if we have a fever of 100 plus, we're to stay at home. Now, you may find these weighed in the balance and lacking somehow that it appears to me that we really don't have any real idea on what to do beyond this with what is occurring. So it's important, I think, that all of us look to God and look to Scripture in particular on what we're really to think about during these times. So we're going to get to chapter 38 in just a moment. But if you have your Bibles or whatever you use to gather the text, if you will, turn to the first chapter because before we get to chapter 38, and we can't cover all chapters obviously today, but before we get to chapter 38 and see God's answer to Job, uh, we kind of have to see what kind of condition Job is in. Uh, there's been a lot of talk and there have been people who have suffered. Uh, there have been people that have COVID, that have had COVID-19, that have had relatively mild symptoms, as you know. And then there are some who are no longer with us. They have passed away through this virus. But we would all have to agree in a few moments, if you don't already know, that what Job went through seems to be even much worse than what anyone can describe today as bad as it has been. In fact, in chapter 1, we're introduced to this man from the land of Uz whose name was Job. And then we're introduced to, to his largesse, if you will, to his possessions. Uh, that he was, uh, in their words and in our words, he was an extremely successful man. He possessed, it says, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. Now, why are they listed? Because you can get even more donkeys, if you will and very many servants. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Now before that, we're told he has seven sons and three daughters. So he got his yard mowed, amen. That's a little inside joke with me. So he has all of these things. And so if anybody had saw Job, during this time, they would have said Job was an extremely successful man. Now, he was also a righteous man. 
The Bible says that through all of the things that we're going to talk about in just a moment, through all of these things, he did not curse God. Now, he was counseled by his wife, you remember, to curse God and die, but he does not. He is a man who is, among men, a righteous man. Now, I want to suggest to you as we work through this today that there are some important, under, some really important theological understandings that we need to apply to our lives and to the world in which we live in. We are about to see in Job a good man in the sense among men. Now, we know there is none good except for God, but he's a good man relative to man. And a righteous man, we're about to see him suffer. We're about to see him suffer. Now, of course, during this time, I, like you, in addition to working out three times a day, I work out in the morning, they call that breakfast. I work out at noon, they call that lunch. And I work out at supper. Amen. But in addition to working out, I once again had the opportunity to look for preaching on Sunday mornings. Now that's what we're doing here. We're going to have our service available to anyone who would care to watch. Uh, and we hope it will be available by Monday morning. It will not be available on Sunday unless you do it in a delayed way. But I had the opportunity to watch, and you know, once again, I kept hearing this either subtle or in some cases not so subtle at all notion that if you're a child of God, you will not suffer. Now, I'm going to ask this question. When is the last time you heard a TV preacher preach on the book of Job? When is the last time you heard an honest broker concerning the Word of God who actually told the truth about God? It starts with this notion of, well, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Is that true? Of course it's true. It's from Scripture. It starts with this notion that, that God loves you. Does God love you? Yes, God loves you. But out of that comes all kinds of deviant notions that, that forget the fact that you and I were born into a sinful world and that we are a part of the fallen creation. And as Jeremiah said, it what? Reigns on the just and the unjust alike. Amen. And so here it's about to tell us why it's about to rain on Job. Do you know why it rains on Job? Does it rain on Job because of Job? Does it rain on Job because Job hadn't got up in the morning and, and claimed the anointing? That's a, that's a buzzword I hear today. I, that, that is a biblical word, but the way it's been taken, it's not biblical in many cases. But you hear today, because you have the anointing, I had a lady tell me this, this the other day, she said, because you have the anointing of God, no sword shall prevail against you. Well, let, let me just say this. I'm on my way to heaven and, my, and there is no sword that can take my soul. But there's lots of swords that can take my physical life. And you'd be foolish to think they can't. By the way, did Peter cut off Malchus ear, the servant? Yes, he did. Did Jesus put it back on? He certainly did. But we have to have a biblical understanding of these things. You know, I'm kind of reminded of when I was talking to this guy one time and I, I said there are facts. There are things independent of our own judgment about them. There are facts whether we assent to them or not. And he said, I don't want to be confused by all that. <laughs> and I think that's the problem we face today in the church and outside the church is folks don't want to be confused with the facts. I want to know what the facts are, don't you? So anyway, Job is 
involved in through no fault of his own. Now watch this. A battle between God and Satan. Through no fault of his own. He's not a child of the devil. He's not a product of the devil. He's not worshiping the devil. He's not walking after the devil. He's not doing any of those things. But he is going to be affected by the battle between God and Satan. Listen to me, my brothers and my sisters. There are things that occur that are beyond us. And there are things that occur that affect us but are not directly because of us. Amen. Now, you know what it's like to be consumed by yourself? Why is this happening to me? You remember that song from Hee Haw, Doom, Despair, and Agony on Me? And then it goes on to say, if it weren't bad for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Y'all remember that highly cultured show, Hee Haw? Whoa! <laughs> now, isn't it true that when something happens to you that you perceive negative, the first question you ask is, why is this happening to me? It's not why not, it's why. It's why is this happening to me? And so, here we have... This battle that's about to occur. Satan appears before God because God is the sovereign one in this story. Excuse me. He's the sovereign one in this story. He's the sovereign one in our world today. Amen. Satan appears before him. And so let's pick up here again in chapter 1 where it says, The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then, then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for no reason? Haven't you put a hedge around him and all his house and all that he has on every side? Now as we go along in this, and we have to move because we don't have enough time to to work through each detail of it. We, we know that the Lord says, well, you can begin to touch some of the things of Job. Yes, the Lord says that. The Lord says that. The Lord says that. Let, let me suggest to you, when you sign on for a relationship with God through salvation, you accept the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Not just part of it. You accept the whole thing. Now that shouldn't surprise you. When, you. when you signed on to the job that you currently hold, is everything about it good and positive and easy and wonderful? Well, let me ask you this. Why don't you go and tell your supervisor tomorrow? Of course, you're afraid to do that, right? I'm just, I'm just exaggerating here. Why don't you go tomorrow and tell your supervisor, look, I signed on for the good stuff. We got some bad stuff. I didn't sign on for that. Your boss will say to you, no, you signed up for everything that comes your way. And if you can't do it, I'll find somebody else who will love you. <laughs> Might not say love you. I don't know. But here's the point. When you come to Jesus, you become his child, his servant. You sign up for everything that's a part of the kingdom's work. And so Satan, who is allowed to, by God, to move against Job. Now look at chapter 1. The latter part of that is just calamity after calamity after calamity. At least today, maybe you can be encouraged and say with me, I'm so glad I'm not Job. At least maybe you can say that. Because look at what happens to Job in uh, verse 13. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. 
And the Sabaeans fell on them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and struck them down and the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, you know what I'm thinking? Could we build a wall? around this and keep the servant. I'll shoot the next servant that comes over here to, to, to bring me bad news. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, verse 18, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in, in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people and they are dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. Wow! Wow! Job, and it appears in just a matter of a few hours or a few days, he has had everything that, that we prize and value destroyed or taken away from him. And you say, well, he still has his health. <laughs> Amen? He still has his health because you hear people say this all the time. The most important thing is your health. So he still has his health, right? Now before we get there in chapter 2, here's what Job says. And the Bible says he is a righteous man. And, and there's no better indication of that than what he says here. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You hear that sometime, sometimes at the graveside. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. We live in a world that people can be mad at God over a hangnail almost, right? Mm -hmm. He still has his health. Well, Satan appears also. Again, before the Lord... Chapter 2, verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And then he goes through this. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. And Satan says, Well, you know, that right now, but I think I can touch him in a way that he'll turn against you. Now think it through. You're sensible people. I think I can touch him in a way that he will turn against you. Does that happen? Hmm. Does that happen? Yeah. 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 As a pastor, I hear people's stories all the time. When I invite them to church or, or to know the Lord, I hear stories all the time about what they have been through in their lives Therefore, they no longer believe in God. What they have been through in their lives, therefore, they no longer attend church. What they have been through, therefore, they no longer pray. What they have been through, therefore, they no longer read their Bible. Of course it can happen. Of course it can happen. Things that don't make you better make you bitter. Things that don't make you stronger destroy you. I think there are people who are even suspicious of me who think I've had a pretty good run of it. I think I have too. But don't think it's been without flaws or without difficulty. I wouldn't know anything to say to you if I hadn't been through a few heartaches of my own. Amen. Well, so 
verse 4, chapter 2. Then Satan answered, Lord, and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to him, to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. God limits what Satan can do. Amen. Now let me ask you, does God love Job? Yes. Amen. Amen. That is the most mature in Christ thing you can say. Believe me, if you have any doubt about that, you're in trouble. Because I know he loves Job. I know that in a few short years relative to eternity, he will stretch out his hand on the cross to save Job from his sin. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I know that though Job may lose everything that he values, there's one thing that he will not lose because God loves him, and that is his soul. Amen. Amen. Which is the most precious thing you have. Well, he gets balls and sores. Whoa. I don't know if he gets leprosy, perhaps. But he even takes a, a broken piece of pottery to scrape himself. And he sits in ashes, chapter 2, verse 8. Then his wife comes along. Now... Can I say something? This is going to go along. You know what? I don't think I'll say anything. <laughs> it just occurred to me that this may go farther than I want it to. <laughs> and it's not personal about mine. This, this, is, this is just a statement about his. So I'll, I'll just let you do whatever you want to do. And then I'll just move on. That, see, that's what happens when you grow older. As a, as a preacher, you get, you get just a little bit smarter. Not a lot smarter, but a little bit smarter. So let's just, here his wife appears to him. Do you still hold fast to your integrity, curse God, and die? Then his friends appear to him. Those three friends are mentioned in chapter 2. And now would you go to chapter 38? Because we have, we have Job who I think you and I can agree has in our way of thinking a right to complain against this situation. And to be honest with you, he will complain about the day he was born. And the complaints that he makes, even though they are not necessarily directed toward God in a sinful way, God takes note of them anyway. Now, will you, will you stay with me just a moment? By the way, you'll get to see this again tomorrow. Now, stay with me just a moment. The complaints that he makes, though they're not necessarily directed toward God, catch God's attention anyway. Lay in there with that just a moment. Because we need to be reminded that when Job curses the day he was born, here's what I think he's saying to God. Why was he born? Whose idea was it that he be born? Would you agree with me? That was God's idea? Amen. Would you agree with me that when he was born was God's idea? Sure. Would you agree with me that when he dies will be God's idea? Amen. And so would you agree with me, and I hope you will, that some of our complaints as justified as they seem to be, are probably not a whole lot different than Miriam, 
grumbling and complaining about her brother, Moses. Aaron joining in as well. And how do I know that? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. I read chapter 38. I read chapter 38. Look at chapter 38. Look at chapter 38. A good, a, a good preacher that I really, really enjoy a lot uh, was speaking on this and some other passages. Uh, I think several years ago, but I think I heard it this past week. Um, I know that God takes note of what's been said even though it hasn't necessarily been directly directed, if you will, at God because God takes it personal. God takes it personal. Which is a reminder that God is the sovereign one here. And when we're talking about all that we've been through in these last few weeks and months, don't forget God has been and still is the sovereign one here. In fact, I, I, I can't help but say that because of all of these press conferences I've seen, and I haven't seen many. I've strayed away from watching the news as much as possible, but I felt like to have some context of what we're in, I had to pay some attention but it's been pretty much, most of it, fairly useless. Amen. The reality is, is man really has no idea what to do. Does he? Now, we went to the moon, and we've done all these things, but what, are, what do you do when you get the common cold? <laughs> and I'm not comparing COVID-19 with the common cold, but what do you do when, the, when you get the common cold? Suffer. Suffer. I think you got it. <laughs> but, but before we get on with this, that God is the sovereign and man is still man... We need to be, all of us, including those who are arrogant about this, need to once again be reminded that our lives can change just like that. Amen and amen. <laughs> if I had told you two months ago you could be out of work, somebody, somebody uh, you could be affected by something that nobody's ever heard of, the churches would be empty and all these things would be occurring, you would have probably thought I was a maniac and yet that's exactly what's been occurring and that man would have really no particular answer for the malady in which he finds himself in. But back to this. Back to this. God speaks to Job. Boy, you know what? Let's get a little humble. Let's get a little humble pie here. We need, we need a little humble pie. We need a little humble pie because uh, we get caught up in our situation and we believe God is like soap on a rope. He just exists for us. Where is God? Doesn't he know what I'm going through? Well, you certainly does. So you want to see what God says to him? This always reminds me of the folks that say, when I see God, I'm going to ask him. Yeah. You, I tell you what, you go ahead, I'm going to stand behind you. Now by behind you, I mean at least six feet. <laughs> because I'm going to exercise social distancing in that moment. I want to stand way behind you. Maybe 12 feet. Because here's what God says to him. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And that's the title of the sermon. God speaking out of the whirlwind. And he said this. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> oh, 
what, what's being said here? What is, what is God introducing here? He's introducing, can I just say it in, in just, base, just base terms? Job, you have no idea what you're even talking about. There's only one who understands the complete picture. His name is God. Amen. Verse 3, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. In other words, you've asked me some questions. i got some questions for you. I've got some questions for you. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Have you ever had criticism fly all over you? Have you ever done something and had some, have somebody come right in behind you and criticize it? Or have you had somebody who didn't criticize it to your face criticize it to somebody else and they made sure that you heard about it because they love you? <laughs> Brother Stan, I need to talk to you. I'll make sure you know how much the love is. <laughs> Got to make sure I spread some love. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Can I just fast forward here and say Job doesn't say nothing? He's, he's got nothing to say. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Do you, do you hear God even engages in sarcasm? I had someone say one time, you're too sarcastic. Well, I, I could be. But God here in Scripture engages in sarcasm, if you will. Oh, surely you know. Surely you know. Why? Because before this, Job has explained all mysteries. <laughs> and can I just say it this way? God's just standing there. Job? Well, I didn't know that. Wow. I've learned something today. Or who stretched the line upon it? Mapped it out. Who did that? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. And prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors. And said thus far shall you come and no farther. And here shall you proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began? Another way of saying this is, is the sun can't come up until Brother Stan says so. <laughs> and cause the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. What is, what is being said here? And, and you can go on. It's, it's, the whole chapter is worthy of reading. And it's, it's, just, it's just statement after statement after statement is essentially expressing the same sentiment from God. And that is, Job, I'm God and you're not. I'm God and you're not. Uh, do you like to be God? Come on. Come on. Come on. You know the most fundamental thing to all of us is control. We love it. We love it. 
Now, some people are so immature that it's, it's readily apparent. You can see control in them almost at every level of their lives. Some of us know better, and we try to suppress it. But it's there. It's there from a group of fishermen who don't think Jesus knows anything about fishing. <laughs> I love that, don't you? Hey, well, Lord, we've been fishing all night. You're just a rabbi. We're fishermen. <sighs> Peter, Peter probably would uh, get in, that, in those little groups and he would probably say, we caught a fish, uh, we caught a fish, we, we caught a we know how to catch fish. You tell us to throw down our nets. What happened? They threw down their nets. What did they get? So many fish that it broke the net. John's Gospel, it says 153 fish. Peter drugged them back in a net. We like control. Our complaint against God many times is things are just not under my control. Things out of my control. When you go to the doctor and, and uh, doctors have a process by which they do things, as you know, some of you know more than I do, but you know how they'll, they'll go out and look at the computer and look at the test results and then they come into the room and then sometimes they'll kind of do like a lawyer. They'll go back out of the room again. I don't know what that's all about. And then they come back again. Used to, you'd find out they were taking a smoke break or something, but I don't think they do that anymore. But uh, anyway, having said that, so you're in and out of that fear because health takes you to a place that you might not want to go and you don't have much control over. Truth of it is, getting up this morning, I really had no control over that. Oh, I set my alarm. I did that because I was afraid maybe I wouldn't wake up this morning like I should and leave as early as I should. But I don't have near as much control as I think I do. God's complaint against Job is, is you're, you think you have more control than you do and you're a little bit more arrogant than you ought to be. Because you realize that every day is a gift from me. That you serve me. That I'm the sovereign one. Amen. And you're not. That's right. A thought occurred to me, and this is not simply meant to be directed toward those who are suffering or those that are sick, you know, I would never do that. But you know, Scripture gives death as a grace. Amen. It does. Because in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned, right? And uh, there was a tree of life that they could have eaten of. And if they had eaten of that tree, one would speculate that they would have lived in a fallen condition eternally. And yet God arranged that so it wasn't possible for them to do that. And so death itself is a grace. But we live now as if this life is all there is, including preachers that say your best life now. Well, let me ask you this. If you're going to have your best life now, then what's heaven all about? Right. Amen. Those that suffer, we're sorry you suffer. We're sorry Job is suffering here. Nobody finds pleasure in suffering. Nobody. And yet Job is engaged, involved, if you will, in a conflict between Satan and God, not of his own making, but of the sovereign one's choosing. Amen. 
This is what it comes down to. I trust him. I trust him. And if I can be useful to him in his glory, so be it. And I think that's the story of Job. Because we all suffer, don't we? Amen. We suffer sometimes because of choices, because of what other people choose. We all suffer. We all try to make sense of this suffering. And sometimes it really has nothing to do with us. It is something beyond us. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the word this morning. Lord, we thank you for this story of Job and, and Father, that we're reminded that you are in control and we're reminded, God, that we don't have to be. And that we're reminded that there is a better place ahead. And that we're reminded through Scripture that you do limit those things which can be done. That we're not a fear the one who can take life, but we're to fear the one that can take both soul and life. And we bow before you with Job this morning, realizing you are the sovereign one, the creator of all things, and that we don't have your perspective. That if we did, we would understand better why all of these things have happened. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.